Hello, everybody, and welcome to Music Real Talk with Marvin. If you like what you're hearing, please subscribe. Episode four. We made it. Very good. All right. What's a good place to start? What? I a song. <laughs> <laughs> no, not a song. We're going to start talking about gypsy jazz. Gypsy. Gypsy jazz. So we are some of the only people who learn how to play gypsy jazz in the street. Literally, we played, uh, we used to busk. Don't gypsies live on the street? I think gypsies do live on the street. <laughs> no, they live in caravans. Caravans, but those caravans are on the street. Houses oh. are also on the street. <laughs> That's true. Um, but yeah, it's very funny. It's a very funny style of music. Uh, I don't think there's anything else like it in jazz. Like you could, you could claim that like bebop is kind of centered around Charlie Parker. But it's not. There's like other people. There's Dizzy Gillespie. There's what's the name of the piano player everybody likes? Bud Powell. Powell. There's Monk a little bit. Max Roach, Mingus. So it's like a, a whole slew of people swings the same way. You know, it's like there's Louis Armstrong, but there's Sidney Bechet. But with gypsy jazz, there is only Django, which is fucking crazy. And um, it created this mono, monotheistic thing now it it came to me i was doing um you, by the way you guys should check out that episode of guitar wink i did guitar wink which is with scott henderson and uh well it's not out yet is it bruce For- well by the time this episode airs it will be out oh why? um so troy mccubbin and bruce foreman and uh we were having a lot of fun we were talking and when we were talking it occurred to me that gypsy jazz if anything like to say that the style of music is like saying that all these Elvis impersonators in Vegas are a style of rock and roll, you know? And it's very funny because, you know, I talk to Tommy Davey a lot, uh, who owns DjangoGuitars.com, and he's always telling me about some drama in the thing. And it's like there's, you know, their whole priesthood, priesthood like cast is like fighting and bickering because they're all resentful because they don't have careers. But like there's like 30s Django, which is like skinny Elvis, and then there's like but they actually one to have a banana sandwich. sandwich you have to you have to mention that yeah yeah well we, i mean we had a jimmy Rosenberg interview he said like he made uh, millions or something in like a few years yeah like he had a but, Ma- maserati or something i don't know yeah he had some crazy cars he was touring with willie nelson uh you know Birali and stockholm no, no he had a lamborghini yeah but i don't know he's also really out of it so he might have and been lying, lying. <laughs> <laughs> that's also true <laughs> and give me your tears according according according, <laughs> according to him but uh yeah that's a no, no i'm sure yeah. i'm sure they made some some killer money but yeah but i think a lot of the bickering is like this kind of uh you know casino priest elvis kind of who's like marrying people all day this like your cafe gypsy jazz guy but it's so weird because all these dudes play the same licks and i'm very hated um in the community i guess i think people 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 really view what i'm doing in every community really. and, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good at that even when we like fire people even in our community in our community <laughs> like people like what tends to happen is like all the bad shit that was ever said is put on me and danny's always friends with them after yeah uh and they forget all it's like sometimes they'll sit him down and give him like the, the most horrible talks i've seen some of these like very very honest very upfront and they're having a bad time and then they'll remember it as if i do it i don't know what happens there but you but, just always add the last straw really that's what usually happens um, yeah you I'm just good chime in from, from the back and we're like, oh, fuck with yeah. guy. And your pussy stinks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 But, but the amazing thing about gypsy jazz is how acceptable it is. Because I don't think it would be accepted to go, whoa, Nicholas, and you better be zub zub. That's my Lee Armstrong impression. Yeah, that's but, pretty good. Well, yeah. It was, it was better on two when we were actually doing it. But yeah. Yeah, I, just, I don't think it's acceptable. I, I just think it would be so funny if, like, you know, 
15 years go by and our albums, you know, kind of make their rounds in the world and history. And then some people just, you know, kind of, I don't know, take last chapter of dreaming and learn a few songs and get like a band together and then call a venue. And it's like, what do you do? It's like, we play kike jazz. It's like, they're like, what? It's like, we played like, you know, like Jew jazz, like kike jazz, like those kikes in Marbin. Like we made a whole style called kike jazz. And yeah, but, but you see, but it's the way it happens. It's, the, it's not like that. So it's like, we would have to start it and we would have to start like a school and no, call it no, Jew jazz. No, no, Django never, the, the term gypsy jazz never happened during his lifetime. He thought he played jazz. He just oh, played jazz as an really? acoustic. So who started it? The, the guys that followed, like Birelli, yeah, but he and, didn't, the didn't second he, generation Okay, but people. didn't he teach the second generation? He didn't teach anything. He didn't teach anybody. They weren't related, all those people? Some of, like, I'm sure the people Actually, in his is family. Actually, is anybody related? Because you have, you know, he, all his those son, His son and his grandson play. And, uh, no, no, the, but what? His cousins play. Is it like him. the Reinhardt family? Yeah. Yeah, there's Reinhardt's who play jazz. But I'm saying, in his mind, and according to all these interviews, like he just thought he played jazz. He, he was trying to do the Louis Armstrong thing, yeah. you know, uh, with, with the instrumentation, with the rhythms, with what he could pick up from, I don't know, hearing it on records and on the radio. And that, that was the attempt. Wait, wait, but that's actually interesting. So it's because in the Gypsy Jazz, they have like families, right? Yeah, it's, they have the Rosenbergs. That's a big one. They have some other ones uh, <laughs> no but they do have the some Schmitz. yeah yeah so they so Django wasn't like he had a family yeah but it wasn't like a big because Rosenbergs are like the biggest family in the style I feel like uh there's there's a few Rosenbergs and also I think um they have there, there's another there's like a, another name that's also basically Rosenbergs like yeah that's what I'm saying because I remember it was another caravan. person yeah but but yeah i mean because sometimes it's like the mom and they don't take the name you know yeah but my, that's my all like yeah that's what i'm saying so mm-hmm. my question is like so how did it how did they learn it if they didn't learn it from Django? or like they just well now they're all learning it on youtube i know but how did it happen then i'm guessing that they uh, listen the, they hung the, out the, together basically the, all of them i'm 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 i i'm really with the mind that uh Django was the shit and they all just kind of listened to her to his records they had records and they just like they were like this guy's awesome and he's from here and like well but it's not like really the, you know it's like it's like the ver- it's a, the version of LeBron in well, like but the gypsies, gypsy community but gypsies you know they have different and like I know it's like they say Romani people but it's like it's really there's a, there's a bunch of them yeah I'm saying like the traveling Irish right yeah. it's like they're really not they don't I don't think we have any gypsy players in the traveling Irish. Like they, they do more like fist fighting. Fist, um, yeah. That's what they're famous for. Oh, I thought they're doing tap dancing. No. What's that, Lord of the Dance? No, it's, uh, <laughs> they did the movie about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like uh, Snatch. Yeah. Yeah. But like they did a bunch thing. of movies about it. There was also... Yeah, the, the bar, bare knuckle boxing. That's, yeah. that's it. And they're like, a, they call them pikeys or something? Yeah, I don't know. Snatch, I don't I know. Think. I don't know. I don't know. I'm saying it's like, we have... To, Maybe they're related to Django in some other way. But yeah, so they, they bought it. Well, I guess Jesus didn't call it Christianity, right? Jesus yeah. thought he was Jewish. Right. Yeah, but it's so funny to me that like they just take something pretty. And like I love the people that dress up. It's like, you know, there's like a, whole, a lot of you guys are not aware of the gypsy jazz community. But some of these people invest a lot of money in buying like 100-year-old suit jackets and they make they they have that lip mustache pencil yeah. and the pencil mustache and then they they comb their hair like put some grease in it and like really metic I, I remember going to a jam session in chicago this one dude always like dressed to the t's and then he'd pick up his guitar and he sucked he was so bad like and his the funny thing is that his he invented a way of playing. I couldn't stop looking at his right hand because it looked like rest strokes, the same way his clothes looked like Django's, but it wasn't rest strokes. It's like he held his wrist up like in the lady hand position, and it looked like he was about to do a rest stroke, but then it just wasn't it because he was just a visual learner. It was just, it's... Uh, it's it, you just, know, it's like how people make fun of uh, why do it from the suburbs dressing up like uh, black guys from the hood and like, yeah. listening to hip hop. So it's basically if they kept doing it after the style was dead for eight years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd be like, what? What's going on with this dude? Yeah. 
It's really interesting. NWA, it's circa 1920. Sweet. Yeah, but it's it's so much more ridiculous because their dress is so elaborate. It's not just, you know, it's just like they have cufflinks. It's like, I don't even know how to put those on. It's like, dude, I don't know how to tie a tie. It's like, that, that shit is crazy to, to bring all, all, that, all that baggage. Just, you know what it is that it triggers me because uh, I just don't understand men who like to play dress up. <laughs> it's, it's just, it seems psychotic to me. I They're can like, see it because you're like... You know, it's like the way they carry themselves, you know, you have to put on a suit, you live a house, you're respectable. Yeah, but, I guess. But you mostly... But could you imagine if we had a conversation like... You must, you, yeah, you can do it. I'm saying you're mostly sweaty. Yeah. <laughs> but but if, if if I was like, yeah, like I just figured out this thing, it's like harmonic minor five below on E, and by the way, like Tuesday, do you want to go I don't, suit shopping? I don't think it happens together. like that. I think it's like those people find each other. So if you would wear a suit and I would wear a suit, we would meet each other and be like, But what would what do we talk about? Like, like it's like, oh, these shoelaces are so authentic. So I, uh, I'd be like, oh, I love, uh, I love your, uh, yeah, I love your, uh, I love your shoes. It's like, what kind of leather is it? And he'd be like, alligator. And I was like, whoa. Wow. <laughs> I was like, oh, I know this guy in Italy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a, we, would be, we would be best friends. <laughs> that's amazing. Did they get their nails done together? I don't know. Did Django... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's a, I think he, well, he was missing some nails. <laughs> we, we, we shit in the hot house together. <laughs> yeah. Single ply for me. Well, the problem, there's a, in the scene, there's a lot of beta going on. And I think it's, it's tough because, you know, in the jazz, in the jazz scene, there's a lot of challenges to, for advancing, but the people who are, I mean, I'm guessing Joshua Stefan, who's probably like the biggest guy right now, and he's kind of under Tommy Emanuel's uh, wing, too, which is pushing his career. And he also kind of uh, didn't go the festival route and through the tiny little machine that they did have. Did you try to talk to him on the interview thing, what he did? I did try. He never wrote me back. Oh. He's, it's so funny that he acts like he's too big. We saw him with like three people in Chicago. Dude, it was, yeah, in a clinic. And, and it was, it's so crazy because... Uh, I love when people who are less famous than us act like they're famous, like do that distance thing uh, that we don't do with anybody. But, uh, but you, just you know like, what I was thinking? You don't deserve Okay, so they gave me a free a album because I didn't have cash on me and they gave me a free album. Mm -hmm. um, but because I wanted to support him because like this guy who came from Germany and there's nobody here. Yeah. It's like I want to give him something. Um, but I didn't and I've taken something, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not great look for me but uh, not the point you know what I oh, I don't know should I go on a tangent go. it's completely unrelated go go on a tangent I I remembered sometimes people ask me and Danny like if we just met us through, through our uh, women or something uh, or like are you guys famous or you know like some people ask yeah. this stuff and Danny always asks like do you know Miles Davis no do you know Coltrane no and you know, when it comes to value, it's like a lot of people, you can't give them your stuff for free. Oh, you know, no. it's like, even if you are, you know, because every time we, we do, we record an album and we're done, we, we used to, we barely do it now. We give it to a few people that will never buy it, but mm -hmm. we kind of want them to have it. Um, it's usually just friends and family, like a few friends and family, mostly just family now. Mm -hmm. But... It's like how hard it is to get people to listen to your stuff for free. And I, mean, I was thinking, yeah, it's like even if you're Coltrane, it's like most people would not want to listen to it for free. No. Like if you go to a school, like a regular school, and to all the 17-year-olds, you'll be like, hey, here's giant steps for free or love something for free. Nobody wants it. Right. Right? And me and Danny, when we just started, we recorded this uh, improvised duo demo. I played out of tune, really weird stuff. Um and we recorded it and we really liked it and we, our friends really liked it because it was kind of chill music. And we <laughs> printed a few CDs, like 50 or something, and wrote our name and email on it. We didn't phone print number. them, we burned them. We burned them, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. And we wrote our phone number on them. And then we were like, 
let's just give it for free to people, but not like uh, we didn't know about people, <laughs> rappers in Chicago. So we just put it under doors. And when we got a phone call, hey, you guys drop your album. <laughs> yeah, it's like, would you like it back? It's like, I found your, I found your CD. They had a phone number on it. I'm assuming you lost it. <laughs> Here's your album back. Yeah, we totally invented that like rapper in downtown move of like walking around with your like disc man. No, because like, we would, this yeah, we just like, not check it out, just like, take it yeah even if you don't want it it's like it was so hard to give it for free and it's like what you can't you that's can't. what's hard about the music well it's because you think it's it, it's because back in those days you think that there's value built into it but there isn't you know there's and what you're asking for is the most precious resource that exists which is attention yeah and people really it's an act of trust to give your attention to somebody for an hour or For an even hour. but you can you can't even get it for a minute no if you're if you haven't crossed some sort of some sort of threshold with your career with your persona with your music with your something you know there's a lot of ways to get there but but uh you need to establish some sort of relationship you can't just uh force people into this kind of exchange with you it doesn't happen yeah and it's i just remember how frustrating it is because you have something that you like and you make music and you're like some people might might like it like even if it's one percent right right but but the truth is nobody gives a but shit. yeah but you just cannot get people even for free even you're paying money for them to listen to it and you can't get them it's like it's so frustrating well it's it's that it's that uh When you're starting out, you're afraid that people will hate what you do. You're afraid that they won't like it. That, that's like that you'll play a bad solo. But the truth is that the real monster that's out there isn't criticism. It's indifference. There's no, nobody gives a shit that you exist. Nobody cares until you make them care. And you have to think, ver- and, and, and it's also impossible. Like the beginning... All the doors are closed when you start off your career let's say you're a guitar player you put out some music you put out some recordings you like them you think they're good okay what are you gonna do about it and and you just and the truth is you just gotta start clawing at it with like your you know hands and feet till you till something starts working and then you repeat that it's a lot of trial and error yeah but that's what people don't understand when we talk a little bit of shit it's like We don't, you, you don't talk shit about some random guitar player from, I don't know, from Poland, you know, from no. a tiny town in Poland that just started to play three months ago and he sucks. And we're like, oh, look at him, he can't play <laughs> Star Wars to Heaven. Like, just nobody cares. Yeah. yeah, like nobody, exactly, nobody gives a shit. Right. It's like, and we, and we don't. So, you know, you have to have some sort of notoriety for people to say something. Well, I mean, I feel like for me, the, the people that, that I get triggered by Are people who some people care about them and I'm more angry at people for having bad taste in music and kind of disagreeing with my judgments but you know back back to your show and about about what's happening with him is that he did something similar to what we did not with you know the intensive touring and everything but he didn't use the front door he didn't go and hang out in the festivals and do all that stuff he did some of that but he just made really popular YouTube videos. And got super famous in the gypsy jazz world and circumvented a lot of the um, a lot of the people who are at the top of the hierarchy and want to yeah. stay there like Birelli like Stoklo and he's not getting that kind of crazy money per show that they are like the headline of festival which is not crazy anymore like I don't know five ten grand uh, per show but he is getting all this new opportunity and he's increasing the market and And this is the thing. It's like that scene is so small that everybody there is looking at it like a zero-sum game. And also there's like um, there's this kind of racism built into it that like, you know, authentic gypsies need the, you know, are headlining. They're playing the big gigs. And uh, there's a lot of people who just love the music who are forced into this beta position of just, you know, explaining what the real gypsies do to... To the YouTube audiences now but yeah you can't uh, th- this is the thing for me I, I find it very lucky because I just don't want anything from these motherfuckers because yeah it's not the kind of career no no again if somebody tells me hey here's a lot of money to play for me and Danny I'm like go play Gypsy just for a lot of money I'm like sure sure yeah why not but yeah, but yeah. I really want to play Fusion no but they have their own tiny little machine and their own they don't even have their own clubs they have like a night in a club 
Like in the green mill, Wednesdays is gypsy jazz night. Yeah. There is something that people don't understand, but you, you don't, you know, you don't uh, get something from a machine without giving you a pound of flesh. It's, it's like those people want you to, it's like they want you to submit a little bit in some ways. We, we, we see it all the time. Yeah. Like we see it with festivals, we see it like, um, I just have some names I just want, don't want to mention, you know, but it's like even some jazz organizations, right? That we even did some stuff for. Mm-hmm. Um, the, just the way they want you to position yourself is basically like, I'm at your mercy. Right. That's kind of that's kind of way, and if you don't do it, we just will not fuck with you. Right. And, and also, and it's like me and and Danny, it's like we, and Danny and I, we just we would not do it. And well, I mean, there's, they put you in a position where you know you accept their money, and then you get used to their money. You're starting to build a life, and you assume that's your level of income, and then they can stop it at any time. And the truth is that they give you, they get a lot, but they give you a lot too. So you know, for if you have some sort of well let's let's imagine this is 15 years ago and you had some sort of uh deal with blue note or verve and they paid for your albums and they also paid to fly you to europe and they also paid you know the for promotion for those albums so the magazine writes about you you get a manager you get a booking agent whatever but we don't even have to take it that that in in modern times it still happens like in metal you know we know uh we know the guys in haken and uh they're we open for them. They pack, they pack the rooms. And, they didn't. They, they didn't make the like again. We we can't shouldn't really go to what's going on with them. But I can only say that they didn't make the money they should have been making. Well, they. But that that's exactly that's that's what I'm bringing up. I'm saying, well, it's hard to determine what they should have been making. Like what percentage of the money you're generating do you deserve if without the people that put you in position. To be there, like again, they had a raw deal. You know, yeah, but, but also without, but without them, there, there is nothing too, because they're right. the talent. Right, right, right. But the question is, like, how long is the line to to have their positioning? Like, how many other bands could they be replaced with that just write equivalent music? That you know. Well, specifically, hey, can not a lot because they, they, right. they, they passed through, like they broke through. But there, right. are, there are a lot of bands. But the kind of deal that you cut cut with I think metal is probably the only machine that's still standing yeah uh, we see it but there are a lot of bands that never would never made it but had like a nice deal yeah well, not a nice deal sorry we had like like we had a machine that was behind them for a little bit mm-hmm. and then just don't stop being behind them well people like us like those po- business pop people music those, those pop people don't want to fuck with us because we're not naive I think that's really what they, they get a vibe for us. It's like, oh, well, know. well, the guy, you know, I saw an interview with a guy from the Fuji's and um, I don't remember his Staying name. Staying Alive? That's the Bee Gees. Fuji's? Oh, Wycliffe Jean or whatever? Yeah, Wycliffe Jean, Lauren Hill and... That guy. And yeah. So he was saying... Ghetto superstar. He was talking that about uh, how he's, he was out of his mind when he was doing his solo album and he was, right? Uh-huh. He was talking to Talib Kweli. And which is another rapper, if people don't know. I'm guessing people know who Talib Kweli is, right? Yeah, everybody knows the Talib Kweli. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he was talking to him, and he was talking about how he only sold 90,000 records from his first album. And when Talib Kweli was like, yeah, what's funny part is today is amazing, right? It's like back then, right. like 15 years, 20 years ago, it was terrible. So, right. so he said the label dropped him, and nobody would work with him anymore. And we heard, you know, we heard, uh, what's the name? A guy from The Black has talked about his wife, that she sold only 200,000 of her last album. And we're like, yeah, we're not, we're not doing it anymore. And nobody would work with her. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, these people coming out of the compact disc era were used to numbers that were crazy. And there was no re I mean, since they were all working percentage, you really need to move a lot of money to make it sensible because it's, you're operating a very big machine. You know, yeah, but I'm saying it's like those people, once, like you said, once we were done, we were done. I just, I, we were just talking about this, that uh, we were hanging out with Steve Rodby, who was teaching us how to do some uh, audio, production work, yeah. some production work. Steve Rodby, for the people who don't know, was the bassist in the Pat Metheny group in the 80s and 90s. And 2000s. And, and 2000, yeah. And, and he's always kind of worked closely on the editing. And he was telling us that The Way Up, which came out in 2005, I think, was the last time like the whole they went into this album thinking that like this is the last time a label's gonna give 
a significant amount of money for a jazz album to be made. Let's really use it and make something big. And that's so long ago. That's like before me and Danny met. Yeah. And it's like this whole this whole business has just been in like such a such a free fall. And yeah, I mean it's it's weird to think about in today's in today's uh environment where there's uh, it seems to me like the only direction this is going is to now cut quality completely, make everything at home, make it with like digital gear, which is another thing man people people are asking me about about digital gear on the live feed like xfx and like fractal and all this stuff this is it's like that i don't remember do you guys remember that that 80s like uh tv sh- tv show like for kids where like the guy gets sucked into the computer game it's like a cartoon that's like the theme song every time him and his dog get sucked into the tv that's all digital gear always makes me think of because it's like if all the textures are electronic it makes sense to just dive into the computer to become another digital noise, you know, to use all those, you know, all those like cab simulators and all that. You're just shrinking your sound. You're diving into your desktop and now you're a tiny little layer in a sea of tiny layers. To, ma- to bring like the sound of a big tube amp in there with a mic, it's, it's counterproductive. You don't need that. You need to be as small as everything else. But um, yeah, like I said, it's like... Uh, it's like fake tits, you know, it's not, uh, it's plastic. It's not, it's, it looks good from a distance, but like you don't, you don't want that shit in your house every day. You want the real analog stuff. It's like a real woman. Breaks down once in a while. Fix it. <laughs> <laughs> you mend uh, and you move on. But yeah, yeah, it's weird. I think there's a whole, a whole generation too of people uh, of guitar players now that are growing up, what we refer to as the pajamas, that uh, really, who came up with it? Did John come up with I it? I think John came up with pajamas. John, shout out to John. Yeah, shout out John Adel. Uh So, he, pajamas are people who sit in their pajamas, and jam. <laughs> for those of you who need context, YouTube and uh, yeah, Instagram. And stuff. I think Jam Track Central. In the internet, they, they were they were one of the companies that really pushed that Guthrie Govan and people like that kind of are the start of that but he's kind of half half in the real world half in the pajama well it's uh, always the first person is yeah but it's it's weird it seems to me like a lot of them like their touch I can see their physicality it's like you're when you're used to, di- to digital gear you don't push the strings in the same way you know you know but you know it's, it's like what I was saying in uh, in the last episode last week <laughs> about about the story, right? So it's the same thing with Guthrie, I think. But he, if I think what Guthrie's story is to me, and again, I'm a guitar player, so, but I, I heard about him like a while ago. So I'm trying to think what the story is. The story was, I felt, was like this insane guitar player that nobody knows. Mm-hmm. It's like, like there was people that nobody knows that are... Com- complete secret and look at this guy right. like he's well, got everything figured out and he's like the most insane guitar player but you never heard of him that kind of thing that was the beginning of YouTube I think the beginning of YouTube was like oh my god now there's a window into the bedrooms where all this amazing talent that just didn't make it through didn't push through the you know the, 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 yeah, the, the machine the machine yeah you know now we can see into the bedrooms and see this amazing guitar playing and like Bukowski said there is no talent hiding in the bushes I really believe that real talent pushes through one way or another um, but uh, yeah you saw it quickly like he pushed through but there were not a lot of people after him that did it not the well, same size they, not the same way it's weird like back to the women metaphor I always feel like you know this this uh I, i'm thinking uh, what's the name of that italian guitar player plays with his fingers <coughs> Mat- no it's a spaghetti <laughs> <laughs> Matteo calzone <laughs> yeah uh i think Matteo something i don't i don't remember his name i talked to him once he's a nice guy as a kid uh but uh you know he's like a fusion guy did you do the, uh, i wanted to do a, i wanted to do an interview with him but i don't know we ran out of time <laughs> <laughs> I, I gave up. Uh, so. But he had pizza in Melbourne. <laughs> it's so nice to be in an age where it's okay to be racist against Italians. Well, like why is it racist? Cares. I don't know. It's, it's mocking. 
What the pizza? <laughs> <laughs> it's just good. Yeah. Right. I just like because in my head it sounds like I have an Italian accent, but I know outside it just sounds like I'm an Israeli accent. <laughs> Doing an Italian accent. I think you did it great. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, so yeah, these a lot of these new players. It's like it's like seeing a hot 21 year old chick with like perky tits and everything, and it's it's it. It's hot versus beautiful, you know, but then you just don't you don't think about about the reality because they you know when you see when you see a woman that's like at that kind of energy level and that kind of level of attractiveness, it turns on your monkey brain in this in a similar kind of way. But then when you bring that woman to your house and you start you know like let's say, everything goes great, you get what you want, then you start talking to her and you realize that all her memories are from high school. You know what I mean? It's like, and she's done nothing in her life. It's like, that's how I always feel about these kind of like new players. Not just him. There's like, it's like all of them. They're the same player to me. That like in YouTube, like it's like fucking amazing. And he has like this new technique and it's sexy. And I'm like attracted to something about it. I, for the record, I don't want to fuck this guy. But like, I'm just saying, It's like there's something about the thing that draws me in, but there's a when players are not connected to tradition, you know it's like with Mark I just saw it again uh the Mark Norman thing where he's like <laughs> she's on a date and she's like, "Hey, look at my head, I'm more than a pillow tits like and I'm, not, I'm more than my looks it's like well, that's the only thing you walked on <laughs> 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 it's like yeah, it's like well, it's like I'm And it's like, I don't look good, but I'm funny. I walked on it. I was, you know, I have stuff going on. Right. It's like, you should do eight, at least 80, 20. <laughs> well, well, his bit was great where he said that, like, he's, like, his his game is the hooking off game. And oh, yeah. Uh, women should do that. Uh, stay. Stay. <laughs> stay game. <with> <laughs> You're just going to leave? <laughs> it's like, well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm exhausted. I've been tap dancing here. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Mark Norman. Check him out. Yeah, very funny comedian. Um But yeah, it's, it's a strange kind of thing. You need that depth. You need to be connected to something. Well, it's exactly that, though. It's like if, they, if you work on just having the thing that catches you on an Instagram video. Mm -hmm. It's like if that's what you're working on. Did you hear my conspiracy theory with Instagram? No. I think it's a pedophile ring for guitar players. <laughs> yes, I did hear it. Well, I think... You, didn't you say it all? All right, I, go ahead. I don't remember if I said it, but, but I'll say it again. I really... So my feed is all hot girls... And little boys the tread. So I think they want, for some reason, for me to get <laughs> erections in a Pavlovic way every time I see a little girl that treads. Or a little <laughs> boy that treads. treads. <laughs> yeah. Like eight-year-old bass solo. It's like, <gasps> no. Like you look down at your dick. It's like, oh, no. Because <laughs> it's like, I just get these pictures of every, like all these girls with their tits out. And, and little, little boys that yeah. tread. Like, why, what are they trying to do to us? It's fucked up. Yeah. Just saying, Mark... What are you trying to do to guitar players? Why are you connecting these parts of the brain? What I'm saying, it's like it's the evolution of it that happens, right? So it's like you go, again, similar to what you said, it's the evolution of it that happens. So it's go, go it's like your music just goes, if, even if you do, it doesn't matter if you know it or not. If your music goes on Instagram, it's like you're doing stuff that would work on Instagram. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, we don't do, have music like that. You have to give us, a big amount of attention if you want to get it. Like, you won't get it if you don't... You're not going to get what Melbourne is if you don't give us at least seven minutes. No, no way. I can't do, like, the whole, like, lick of the day kind of thing. Like, th I had a book deal, and it fell through because I couldn't bring myself to write licks. It's just not how I think. Well, they really wanted us to do... We walked in together... Like, it was... Danny got it, but we were walking in together. Yeah, we wrote, we wrote the book, and basically. And then they were like, that's not what we want. This is a conceptual book. We want, we want a lick book. And it's like... Just like, you know... Well, we kept, we kept compromising. So we... We, had, we have issues with books because we think that most books you, can, you don't really... All they, books. All books. I've never... I've other never, than the one we're writing now. <laughs> no, well, we don't write one now. But, but well, it, we will one day, maybe, but like... But again, even if we do, I think the first page should be a disclaimer, which is, we never read a fucking music book that yeah, we like. Yeah, exactly. I've never seen one. I've never liked any of them. 
you know, it was, it might have been a great thing before the internet. But, but we discussed for hours, we discussed how we can make something that would actually, we feel will be helpful for somebody right. that takes the time to learn it. And they just kept trying to put us in a box and until it was like, a, we, but it, we it was don't an think impasse. it's, yeah, we were like, it's not, like, we can't even, like, it, we feel like we're going to lie to people because yeah. it's like, we don't feel like we're going to get anything out of it. And also the thing, the thing that they wanted too was like, you know, a lot of our reach, you know, and, and it's like you, you should, I think as, as a musician or anybody with a platform, uh, it is good to be ethical about if you're going to put your name on something and say, this is how you do this, then it should be at least an honest, ver- it doesn't, you don't have to be right. You can make a mistake. Maybe well, we had a zoom call with them. You know, we, we, we were just saying, if we make somebody, if somebody is going to buy, you know, no, we play, no, Danny plays because it was for guitar players. No, no, Danny plays. And he buys this book and he puts like all the hours that it's going to take to go through this book. It's like we want him to get something out of it right. that's positive. And then, you know, we just couldn't agree. But at the end of the day, Danny knows how to play guitar. Right. So he's the one that, he's the one that's writing the book because he's the one that put in the, the work on the guitar, on his guitar playing. Well, there's just, there's just a very, very, uh, we were talking about two things. They were talking about the licks as the source of knowledge. And I was talking, talking about the place that the licks come from. Because yeah. my licks are not licks. You know, it's like I have moves I do. I have physical things I do, but they can start anywhere in the measure. They can start, they can be in a different subdivision. They, they can, can work on every too. chord and they can have variation inside them. So if you're not teaching somebody, if you're not addressing um, that place in the thinking that is actually the source of the material, the source of the licks, the source of the music, then you're just simplifying the answer to a place that can't encompass the question, you know? And that, that's really the thing. It's like that Einstein quote that things should be made simple, as simple as possible, but no simpler. And they really are always trying to push it to this place. I think a lot of the people with good intentions, the people that are in the book companies, to the place that they think music lives in. But the truth is we don't have a lot of very good players emerging, you know? And we have a lot of, and we probably have more people than ever buying books. Well, and they're saying also... You know, one of the points was, well, you guys are asking way too much from the people, right? And I was like, well, those people shouldn't read this book. Right. It's and like, it's like t- why, why do you want, it's like you don't need, it's like, why do you want Einstein to, to write a book for somebody to, to, to a first grader that needs to learn how to add? You right. know, it's like, it's, it makes no sense. You don't need somebody. Well, you can, I think in education, it's just, it, it, it goes to a place where it's not marketable. Like, it's not reasonable to say, listen, there are 33 modes. You should know them. Yeah, you so know? that's and how I always get rid of my students. I'm like, when I'm, I'm like, Showing hey, the scales? Yeah, some scales. It's like, this is my, that's, that's what you need to, if you want to do it, you're going to have to learn it. Right. And we're like, yeah, it's too much. It's like, you know, I had a lot of people who were like, Again, this one guy I just can't forget because it was pretty early in our career. Mm-hmm. It's like he, he somehow got a kid from Australia. Like he was like 15 or 16. And it was before we had a lot of fans. We were just doing the touring before anything happened on Facebook, before, like, you know, we just playing dive bars before even we made the transition. But he, he had our albums and he was like, oh my God, I want to be like you when, when, I, when I'm older. And... You know, I was like, cool. And he asked me a few questions. So he was like, listen, I really don't have money for lessons and stuff, but can you please just tell me what I need to know? Like, where was, was a good place to start? And I told him about the scales. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it took a lot of time. And he was like, yeah, but that's so much. And it's kind of hard. It's like they taught me to do like this uh, enclosure thing or like a core tone. Core tone, yeah. right? Basically arpeggio. And I was yeah. like, well, <laughs> it's not going to work. And he was got upset. And I was like, you, you want to be me, <laughs> but you don't know how to do the work, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, I'm telling you, but you need to do it. Yeah. So it's like, that's how I always get rid of students, because it's like, oh, that's much? No, no. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's weird, because in some level, I feel like they all know that it's some insane amount of work, right? If, if, you, haven't, if you haven't checked out, if you're going to get lessons and you haven't checked out modes yet, it's like, dude, you're in for years and years and years of practicing and also you know not everybody has that kind of 
that kind of time that like would make a journey like that, you know, or, or have goals that justify this kind of journey. You know, a lot of people just want to play songs, you know, play, get from the beginning to the end, uh, playing rhythm, you know, doing something simple. Or I don't know. For me, it's, it's unfathomable because I was always in such a, I have such a bad time if I don't know, like I can't play a song and not know what to play on one of the chords. You know what I mean? It's like that would make it a nightmare every chorus because I, my mind would just be like, oh shit, like what's, what am I doing there? Random notes. <laughs> yeah, random notes. It's like, uh, <laughs> Geronimo, back to C major. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, an, that's another thing. Uh, another, another topic I kind of wanted to bring up was this thing I, uh, I noticed we were talking about in the context of Miles Davis, but, but really how styles change and how new styles emerge, you know? And we always say that like uh, each, each generation is kind of in a state of rebellion against, against another one. But there's something that's really funny that happened in jazz, which is like, uh, and I think that was really Miles Davis's doing, where a lot of things, a lot of eras tend to uh, appear and then disappear organically. Like there was Dixieland and that went away and swing became very kind of popular and then bebop and also what you would consider american pop like frank sinatra started emerging like at the same time and then maybe you could say avant-garde and fusion started but what miles davis did uh was like he thought it was like somehow the job of uh of an artist in music to be the first guy in every new style of music and just kind of keep updating the music. And he's done it his whole career. He's like bebop to cool, cool jazz, jazz yeah. to whatever. Um, he did some hard bop. Hard bop. And then post bop. Post bop. Some pretty out there stuff. Then really. Free jazz. He did free jazz. Yeah. And then. The really, double quartet. Yeah. And Bitch, Bitches Brew was really, um, like, you know, avant-garde fusion. And then. And I feel like that would have been that would have been a great strategy if they didn't invent the synthesizer. <laughs> but that was just like such a it's like yeah, it's like, hey man, you gotta you gotta integrate like the new tools. You gotta use whatever you got. And then they have that fucking violin synth that's like <laughs> <laughs> No thank you. <laughs> that was really the end of that thing of like going after the technology. It's so weird, like thinking about the eighties. And what it did, because after that, it really, you know, jazz really went all there. Everybody did the Hawaii shirt calculator watch thing for a while, played the worst fucking music. Synth, is, synth sounds just, yeah, so they took over and everybody has a rebellion or like enough. And I understand it. I think it's terrible. So. Yeah, no, it's, it's really awful. And then it went to this place in the 90s of New York and just all the way back to like almost like a Kurt Cobain vibe, like indie jazz. And yeah. Very acoustic-y, very simple texture, very like lo-fi. And yeah, just kind of started over, kept all the weird harmonies, but really went back to old texture. But yeah, that's kind of an unrelated tangent. But it, it's a strange thing. I don't know, for me, thinking about style was always such a such a secondary thought because... We just wrote songs and played with what we had. We grew up like we well, grew up with when so you got, When you get to people already, so you play like the guitar, right? So you get to people. If you played trumpet, then it would be a completely different band. Or if I played piano, right? So you know, once you get two people, you already have a giant chunk of what you're gonna do. Yeah, guitar and saxophone is very specific. Yeah, and specifically distorted guitar mm-hmm. distortion. So it's weird. Scott Henderson and called soprano. us called us a lick band, which I could at first kind of caught me by surprise and I was like oh I get like unison lines yeah. you know it's like I just didn't realize I, I always thought about what we were doing kind of connected to what Travel Tech was doing but I guess it really isn't it's not it, they were really going for a weather report kind of thing if anything it's like Mike Stern's band but not the vibe we're yeah. a very different vibe well we do not do cocaine <laughs> yeah we, we did not do that's, that's a huge huge part yeah, well, I mean, I think their their idea of funk is like Tower of Power. Like, that was really influential on Brecker Brothers and all that, that their aesthetic in ours, 
like our approach to groove really comes much more from the 90s, 90s yeah. from from uh, Rage Against the Machine, from Red Hot Chili Peppers, the music we grew up with. And that's, for me, like what, what a funky groove is, is so much heavier and so, like that. And has the, the, that weird reverby snare drum. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like you're in a cavern. Just <laughs> part, <laughs> part of your drum set is like in a yeah. little cave and that's like normal. It's yeah. a, it's such a weird drums in general. It's just I keep having these moments where I, like whenever we make an album that like I just I'm I'm out of the matrix for a second and looking at drums for what they really are and I'm like why <laughs> why do we have it why do we thing? have this yeah, this that. is so stupid like this like all it, like one guy is playing cook. Yeah, it's like he has just a random collection of sounds that he's banging on, <laughs> and they're all out of tune with the music. Yeah, they're all out of tune and, and, a little bit. That's another we, funny thing. Well, yeah. I mean, it's like the bass we drum. We have to, because if, because if or not, it's I, like... It's I, I was talking up. to a drummer about this. Like, yeah, that's like if you have a drummer who doesn't tune. It's like, shut up. The fuck up! No, nobody tunes their bass drum. How can you put your tenda? If to they, what? Can you tune? Yeah, it's and like, we have harmony. Changes. Yeah, it's like what? It's like that's but that's like the ignorant drummer thing to say. It's like oh, you. It's like dude, we have like the chords keep changing. You can't yeah. play an <laughs> E if the song is an E. You can't just keep playing an E. No, it's it's actually worse. Yeah, if you do that because yeah. it's like you can actually make it out and then it's just like a drone that never ends. I know, but it, it's always a drone that never ends. We just. We're all filtering it out. Yeah. We're all just zoning out those notes. We're like, those aren't notes. Those are drum notes. <laughs> it's, like, yeah. it's like, dude, that is a note. It's, and it's an out of tune note. And yeah, we're just used to it. I mean, if you think about like classical music and the extent that they went to, to mask time, right? In European classical yeah. music, there was a dude standing in front of a are bunch you, of... Are, are you referring to the white stylistic... 19th century white music of white musician. <laughs> That's how he said it. <laughs> We're talking about that. What's his name? Yeah, the stylings of... Uh, never oh, mind. the Just keep going. stylings. Yeah, yeah, keep oh, going, keep going, keep going. We're not going on, on this road. Go, keep yeah. going. Yeah. Um, so all I'm saying is that they went to great extents to bury time, right? It's like the idea was that music was supposed to congeal in the air And this guy, like they took the gestures of a yeah. conductor that you could only see the back of. And I'm guessing in the beginning, you probably, they put him in a pit or something, couldn't probably see, or it, the point wasn't to watch him. It was to make it as, as like inaudible as, per, as, as possible. You think it was somebody's cousin? I was like, how did you get a conductor job like in the beginning? It was like, how could you convince anybody? <laughs> it's like, dude, we, it's like the entire town, because like, they want professional musicians. I can't, I can't imagine what, how, what you, how the fuck do you change a string? What do you have to you do, know, kill a horse? I think it's the person, it's probably the person that wrote the music was the conductor, right? No, it has to for be. For sure, but I'm saying like, I can't imagine, like, you're talking about Beethoven. How would you get 50 motherfuckers in 1810 to show up at the same time? Who had a fucking watch? The king. The king. <laughs> There was a, yeah, it's like it's, he it's sent a, people and they're like, come here, right come now. here, you're getting decapitated, yeah, for sure. Between yeah. between second and fourth star, no, but like, there. what do you do? How do they get instruments? Who's how do you get how do you stay in tune? You like, don't. how bad did it sound? The worst, it was so bad, <laughs> yeah, it had right? To be. It's like you're listening to like this fucking you know, like orchestra nowadays where everybody there is like this Chinese boy has been like beaten to death from the age of like uh, two to I ten to boring. practice I, I 12 hours like a music, day. So. I'm saying, I think it's boring too, but they probably sound like fucking machines from hell. Like if you bring back <laughs> like an orchestra and everybody's like a Monty Python peasant, it's like, <laughs> yeah. it's like they have shit on their forehead, just woke up in a pile of hay. It's like, I'm the... The fucking second violinist. You, you, know, you know what's interesting Life about that? Life expectancy is like eight years old. That's the thing with technology. So before, I don't remember why. Oh, I remember why, why I read about it. But it was like what happened before recordings was that every person had some instruments at home. Mm -hmm. And the way that they have like hit singles or hit songs was people buying the, sh the sheet music. Yeah, the sheet music of it, which is insane. Right. It's like every family needed to have some, like again, life... Can you imagine, not just you don't have Netflix, 
Oh, like no Netflix, no CDs, no television, you no listen radio. You to your like little sister play no, the piano in there. No night. radio, nothing. And it's like, oh my, it's like it's either you're gonna tell each other stories of what you did today, which was, hey, I saw a rock in the field, <laughs> right? <laughs> or you're gonna somebody's gonna learn how to play an instrument, right? And you know, and when they hit songs, or well, one was like, dude. Um, check out our neighbor. He, he said he was a great song, and when everybody would buy the shit music right. for those songs. Well, Scott Joplin, like when he wrote, I think, The Entertainer. So yeah, do 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 able to do a lot of shit like if you oh, see yeah. old people like now you barely have them but if you see old people like they're like 70 80 90 right they're older the better really it's like they all speak a few languages right they know how to fix their car they know how to fix their horse right. <laughs> it's right. like they milk a cow they also know how to knit a sweater <laughs> it's like they know how to do all the things but n- n- so nowadays the, what we did because it's it makes much more sense to to really have one thing that you know how to do well, right? Mm-hmm. And then you do it. And that's, that makes much more sense for the economy and for anything, everything, just to know something well. But there are so many things that don't know how to do anything well, but they also know to know, they don't know how to do anything. Right. They only know how to do one thing badly. Yeah. That's what I thought really happened. Yeah, no, they don't, it's, like, it's like that in the Matrix where they're just growing human batteries. <laughs> we just need to invent a, a robot that comes and eats these people yeah I mean I was I was given a guitar lesson and some, some guy was asking me about how do I memorize all these songs and I was trying to think like just like a phone number it's like, what do people memorize is there anything <laughs> that you need to memorize anymore people's genders yeah. <laughs> pronouns <laughs> that's right it's the only thing left I guess, I guess we ran out so I have to make up some new <laughs> shit yeah yeah it's, it's fucked up no, I mean, it reminds me of that Nate Bergazzi bit where he's like, uh, where he's like, man, if they put me in a time machine and send me 100 <laughs> years back, I wouldn't be able to prove that I'm from the future. <laughs> be like, what's the next president? Be like, Lincoln? He's like, that's the past. Is it from the past? <laughs> Is it from the past? It's like, prove you're from the future. We have cell phones. How does it work? I don't know. I don't know it's like, never works. mind, never mind. I'm from now. I lied. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'll be a server. So I'll be I'll do I'll be doing wars when I'm doing now. Yeah. yeah that's but you know it it it's it, I thought about this joke a lot because it's it's ridiculous, that's why it's funny. But it's so true because every generation, you know, the kids know shit. So you teach right. them stuff. So you t- basically you teach them how to live in the world. They live know how to live in the world now. But they don't know how to live in the world of their grandparents. No. Right? None so, of us will. But, the, but, but the opposite thing is that if you would take somebody that's 40 and you show them an iPhone, they can figure out an iPhone. Right. Because everything is geared toward the next generation, so it has to be kind of easy and a continuation. Right. No, you're, you're always in a unique So it is so. easier and easier and easier and easier and easier, actually. Sure. Like, it's much easier. And, like, there is a lot of knowledge, I think, that, like, you will never, like that people gonna lose like what happens if you're alone in the forest and you need to survive like not for a month but you know sure start no, civilization. No, that's, that's that's gone uh but it's in music you can really see it disappearing i mean the the way people are innovating jazz i mean people people always dis you know maybe discount uh michael buble but i will tell you something about old michael his innovation his gift to jazz is something absolutely revolutionary no solos. I don't know if he invented it, but he definitely is it's the first time I've, It's the first time I've seen it. A yeah. jazz song without solos? A jazz album without solos. Insanity. Yeah. Insanity, you know? I mean, I guess in rock, they're coming, they came up with it too. Like, rock was an amazing... This, when, you know, thinking about structure with new eyes, as if you're a Martian landing here and you just kind of see it without any prejudgment... I'm amazed, like the 80s, that's what got, in, got me into jazz, because there was a compartment built into every rock song where you would have an instrumental solo. Now, granted, some were improvised, some were not improvised, uh, but still, that pocket in time where the idea is that somebody's going to play the shit out of his <laughs> instrument for like eight measures, 16 measures. And it's like, we have to have one. It's like, we're going to pay the most money to somebody to do it. It created a little meritocracy inside guitar and really made 
this thing golden era. I was just watching Matheny videos yesterday, uh, figuring out some of his chromatic licks, um, which I used to do a lot, like, I don't know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Um, 10 years, like, yeah, right, 2007, 8, kind of. Yeah, I was, I was into, into him, but, like, my technique and my understanding was not up to par to do it fast or, like, in some way where I could just pick it up and drop it, like, very lightly. And, uh, it's so weird the way, first of all like his persona like I watched a video in the 80s where he's playing with like Danny Gottlieb and Mark Egan and uh, his whole vibe of like just being like the 80s guy like the long hair like guitar leather hero pants. of jazz that guy's a fucking ridiculous <laughs> dresser <laughs> this is all the leather face leather pants <laughs> <laughs> what, what did, what did well, our drummer Greg had an, what did he say gay lion gay lion <laughs> Gay lion in a sailor shirt. That's how I call them. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I love him. I mean, but was, until I think I just said it was like leather pants. It's just such a good name. It's, again, it's like leather face <laughs> yeah. and leather pants. Leather pants. I mean, he has the short short stuff in Brazil. That's it's shirtless with like the short shorts. It's just, it's ridiculous. Uh, but you see, but it's also great because he's like, he's going for it. Yeah. No, he's, he is fearless, man. And, and he really, I mean, I can imagine his stage face is just like like really like the most like um, like slash or something but no slash is indifferent like like really in there feeling it emoting emoting the solo but i he's really in there um and really going for that kind of energy and i can't imagine being like playing with roy haynes and doing this uh, because a lot of the drummers he played with played with Coltrane, played with like the greats, and everybody played it so close to the chest, like in terms of emoting. You see, like Parker, like you know, in the one video we have, yeah. You see what kind of person he was. Like they, they had their intensity was was musically just as definitely like. Well, it was different. Type, it was different times. Yeah, but even the burning guys, like you know, like uh, Coltrane, that went like all in, you know, in every song. Yeah, it right? wasn't like that. it wasn't like that. It wasn't. It wasn't in the face. It was in the playing. It was sweating. It was intensity. It's like in the eyebrows or something. Yeah, even though it's what you you said about <laughs> you have to you have to say that because you, you thought about it, but you kept saying like all those great musicians like Coltrane and BB King or whatever, and you seen them. And, no, Steve Ray Vaughan. And everybody's sweating all the time. And then you finally realize, wait, we didn't have a say back then. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, was a, that was a shock for me because I was like, I was playing these shows and I was just like, why isn't my intensity, like I see them dripping with sweat. Am I, am I in a wrong compartment of my <laughs> mind? What's happening? And then I just like, wait a second, it's summertime. They're in a hall with 1,500 people with, with like <laughs> one ceiling fan <laughs> and a fucking spotlight on their skull wearing like costumes. <laughs> it's, it's crazy, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, could you imagine how shitty that was to be on tour? How much laundry would you have to I do? I don't know, we did, we did a bunch of our shows, so what way too hot way too hot yeah. way too cold yeah we did that but not every night not, not like that every not night. every day but yeah we did and a bunch of some of them were like fat ass people you know like you have like albert king or something dude he just picks up the guitar it's like he's starting to like bead sweat from his chin <laughs> <laughs> like first note of the show and i always thought it was intensity i was like dude i'm doing something wrong i'm not feeling it you know it's like maybe it's that soul thing everybody's like talking about some people are like yeah that is it's yeah not, it's the soul it's not very it's the soul danny has a thing every time so i like i made a video some videos about <laughs> playing like stevie ray vaughn <laughs> and, and then i've had like people trolling me the stevie people are just the craziest motherfuckers so funny so I, yeah i comment every time danny posts something like that and when some people think i'm serious it's like dude we're in the band together <laughs> lol lol you can, nobody sounds lol like nobody sounds like stevie the guys think it sounds like stevie lol, LOL. yeah <laughs> lol <laughs> <laughs> not even close not dot nobody even, will not understand period like, even point, it, it wasn't even in his fingers close. it was in his soul yeah. the stevie people just come out of the bushes they're just it's like it's like a you know what i saw mm. sorry i saw it uh, you know what i saw i saw our twitter when we thought we we're gonna do twitter for a second uh -huh. and i saw all our twitter jokes do you remember the twitter jokes that no. put up? are they funny you wanna hear them? <laughs> sure okay it's the it started, We're not a tweeting band. Okay, it started, I can't call out a person, but uh, I saw a bass player eat an entire thing of free pizza and had this joke 
that's a, that's a, you know, everybody knows the joke. So my joke was, what's the difference between a bassist and a family size pizza? That a family size pizza I usually can't eat a full bass player in one sitting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I started it. And then there was the best surgeons don't always have the best technique, but they have soul. <laughs> <laughs> surgeons, right? Yeah. Surgeons? surgeons yeah. <laughs> and then there was a guy on Fifth Avenue goes uh goes to a person with a violin case and he asked him, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And the guy answers, you have to play covers, but only of dead people. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. We were oh, and then there was one that was, it was yours, I really like it, though. It was, uh, why do people <laughs> that play washboards are the people that need to wash their clothes the most? <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so that was a uh, blast from the past for, for Twitter. <laughs> All right, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about Mr. Kenny G. I feel like Kenny G is a good is a good subject because I feel you know I have a lot of hate for a lot of people uh, when it comes to like you know contemporaries that I maybe have some unresolved feeling of jealousy but I have no hate towards Kenny G yeah, I never that, have that's exactly what you talked about before though so the people like Pat Metheny Pat Metheny hates him hates him because he thought he took his money Right, because he, he, he feel like very late, like, because Pedmethini also did kind of a smooth jazz thing, right? And again, it's like, dude, the amount of time me and Danny listen to Pedmethini is insane. So don't, yeah, no, we, nobody... We love that. We, no, we listen to... to yeah, nobody come to us about a mil, that. A million hours. Yeah, yeah. it's like, uh, nobody come to us about that. Pedmethini group. And us, yeah. And, um, but we are familiar with everything that he did, so, yeah. Yeah. But he really also played, like, some smooth jazz stuff. Like, yeah. and he really need, like, with his, um, the longest summer, like, the video clips that he did, <laughs> like, for that, with uh, a lot of B-roll. traffic light. Like, it's like, yeah, it's a lot of B-roll. <laughs> but it's like, he really went for it, right? He yeah. really wanted that money. And the, then when the Kenny G market. did it, and he felt like Kenny G doing it, but he's, a, you know, he's like a piece of shit. Like, he felt like he was a poser, like he wasn't for real doing it like he's not really a jazz musician crossing over he's nothing crossing over and like he's taking jazz and using it like the thing that he did with Louis Armstrong uh-huh. like taking Louis Armstrong like, one, one I, was for a, I wasn't offended by it I, I didn't think, care cause I, yeah because why would you care because we're not we're, yeah we're not competing I think it's the same thing that like drives yeah. me crazy with like Jacob Collier because it makes me like people choosing that actively it's it yeah creates... but it's, to me I told you to me it's like he has nothing to do with us so I really don't care yeah him specifically it's yeah like, I guess it's people that you perceive as like taking like participating in your realm like, yeah or like it's or, a, the audi- it's or your, even your audience like him. yeah exactly it's thing. weird you know you know what Kenny G represents to me vegan energy in music <laughs> like i really i really feel like that's like the rigid like that's the this whole idea of the new age like it's it's gone kind of now that's but i don't feel like these people maybe like late 80s early 90s there was this stream of music that was really for like like old school like coastal vegans that that are like I don't know what they do now, but his his energy is just so like those melodies. They're so eerie. In they're so eerily inside. I can't even do it because because I would put. Yeah, with very little syncopation, not a lot yeah. of groove, da, like na, just. Na, na, but even the way, even the way you're doing it, it's like they they would take it more like an Oriental direction, maybe. <laughs> 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 you're thinking about no, Bobby no. Lee, fling, 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 <laughs> doing my little Korean piano. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? I don't remember why I said it. Fling, 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 fling. Yeah. Uh, it's like in the green room in the, the comedy store. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> playing on the piano. What that is said? Doing my so Korean goes. melody. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> Anyways, uh, but no, no, it's it's straight up vegan energy to me. 
manifesting through saxophone with with no no real connection to jazz it's just trying to write pop but it, he is so that he is like when you hear an interview with Kenny G he is so that guy you know what i mean it's like when you, I, I just remember like he's like waving like he's touching his hair when he's talking and he's like like t- touching like the side braid. everything he said is and, like his stories about the yeah, sunlight yeah. about the moon no, and about everything like <laughs> being in a cave or whatever yeah like me, me and my fiance moon harvest <laughs> we went to a <laughs> gathering and uh the, right right when uh the which clock, is again which the is clock great struck 12 in moonlight we went and conceived our baby uh oat flake yeah you know? well, which, which is great <laughs> do what you, you know again to me when i heard it i was like dude whatever i thought about him was yeah, right like this guy likes on, what he does and it's honest music yeah and and he's dude he's going for it all the way yeah. and again you might not uh last week we talked about you know you might not want him in your dinner party but somebody does and it's gonna be and actually i would want him because he seems like a oh he seems right. like he's a riot right? he, like, he probably we, has some fucking stories yeah but it the point is that yeah is is it can be offensive to some people and i don't like his music but he's also like he's he's all is all in if I may I like in, I like people that are all in if I may step in with the role of therapist I would say that old Pat Metheny it probably reflects something that he, some unsettled feelings he has about the Pat Metheny group which is my favorite era of Pat Metheny uh, about the giddy energy of the music and like because they, they were really obviously Pat Metheny had much more harmony and rhythm going on and hip things but it was consonant and In a very similar kind of way they used like triadic harmony they used a lot of the same kind of synth textures synth clavier stuff they used a lot of singing for the melodies a lot of oriental kind of instruments and I think it's just it reflects something to Pat Metheny about himself mm-hmm. and, and that really made him you know really made him not not with the jazz people but really with the pop people that the thing that made him really a global phenomena is that he was just able to communicate and that kind of hallmark energy yeah. you know the people and and Kenny is the king of that he sold 50 million records uh, which is which is a psychotic I think number. For, I think for Ben Thin though it was like really hard with the most just people like especially if it came a second after that didn't fuck with him well right? the, but then he then he went but, but and, and then he went to the fu- to fucking work I know and got all the money you know because he went he got the trio together and And no, no, but I'm saying, but yeah, but the jazz people really, like, were not buying it. Like, when we moved here in 2000, it's like, people were so over Pat Metheny. Yeah, well, right? yeah. Because we were listening to him, and people were so over it. When and I was at us, Berkeley, like, yeah, it was but, already right after it was the Pat Metheny school. And people school. were really against him. Yeah, actively. And, and for us, it was like, well, yeah, it has the sense, and some of the music, yeah, it's a little bit over the top, but it's like, it's... crazy playing yeah great so it's like who cares some of the greatest like, guitar yeah, playing right. of all time yeah so it's like who cares about the other stuff yeah right but for a lot of people it was like we can do it and I think he really wanted to be This, it was that elevator music argument and it's like dude how do you think that shit made it to the elevators and to hold and to like how did weather report stuff make it to Nintendo well, it's like these people These people well you do a parody of something they were you know they were really big fans of this kind of music did a parody of it which the parody was like their version of it that mm-hmm. wasn't as good but when the parody took over that when people hear the original they're like yeah it sounds like elevator music like with us we're like oh you, your music sounds like Nintendo music no it's because it the it the love, yeah. loved fusion those Asian geeks that were like working for a Nintendo loved loved weather fusion. Report and just wrote it on a little keyboard something that had something from those Zo all melodies yeah yeah totally yeah I mean, I still remember the like our, the Israeli version of fusion and like the radio shows only they don't really have drama like segway music in our radio shows is like weird cheesy fusion hits like spiral gyro yeah spiral gyro was huge huge influence on Israeli people not us but you know a lot of the people on the radio yeah it's it's a It's a strange kind of thing. I've, I'm noticing something, you know, now there's, uh, there's a whole slew of players. It's kind of like the acoustic pajamas, which are, you know, 
I call them the slappy tappy people, you know. <laughs> slappy tappy. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. They they like play a whole thing like the whole thing is that like and first of all it's a whole style of music that could only survive on YouTube. Like you can't see a show like that that's insane. And they make an arrangement of like a George Michael song. But they do it like detuning and tuning strings for effect in the middle and you know two hand tapping, harmonics, like all this stuff and clicking the backbeat. And I noticed something, because everybody, you know, nobody accepts this level of Kenny G dissonance unless you slap two and four on a guitar. (laughs) If you slap two and four on a guitar, you're allowed to play the cheesiest fucking shit in the world, like straight, like F sharp minor to C sharp minor, and like just go all the way in. It's because people are such, uh, you know, because people are such pussies and they're just, they can't go with what they like. So people want to hear this music. They want to be like, yeah, over the top music, like really soft. Wham. They love inside. fucking yeah. wham. But but you can't do it because you're, you're more, too self-aware. So you don't want people to make fun of you. So yeah. you have to find a way that it's acceptable. <laughs> and for some reason, an acoustic guitar, you're like, oh my God, look, it's detuning. And it's like, it's crazy. Yeah. And it's like, dude, listen, go with what you like. You know, I think Bukowski said it, right? And it, the thing, but really the least attractive, the most attractive and the, li- like when the least attractive is the lack of, lack of courage is just the least attractive quality. Courage in animals and people is yeah. the only attractive quality. I, yeah, like when you, in high school, people try to teach you that uh, some like intelligence is somehow important, right? Mm-hmm. And when you meet a lot of people that have a uh, high IQ or whatever it's supposed to mean, you're like, dude, these people are boring as shit. Because it, because Again, some people that have IQ, high IQ are interesting, but it's because it's either you're chicken shit or you're an interesting person. Right. You know, it's like you don't like to talk to pussies. That's, that's, that's the truth. It's like people that are afraid to say what they think and, you know, never go all the way. You know, those are a little bit self-aware and cynical. It's like, yuck. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's not, not fun. It's, it is not fun. Do, not, not passionate about every, anything because then maybe somebody can make fun of you. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. There might be repercussions for saying what you think for what we're doing right now. But for me, the thing that I was thinking about... Yeah, somebody told in, me, what if they're not going to want to work with you? It's like, shit, can you go want to do an album with me? <laughs> yeah, Why? That's exactly <laughs> what I was going to say. Like, 10 years we've been in this. And, and nobody wants no, to work with us. Nobody <laughs> wants to work with us. We have to figure everything out on our own, you know, which is fun. We wanted... For a long time, we were banging at the door. But now, you know, I'm saying, like, you know, we're just at this place where we can do it on ourselves. We live well. Fuck your door. Fuck your building. (laughs) You know know what happens to us all the time? It's literally happened to us, like, a million times. Not literally, but, like, uh, figuratively. Happened to us a million times. That we try to walk with somebody, and when it's like, you guys are too small for, you're too small, too small, homie, the stuff you're doing is too niche. It's like, you know, fusion, whatever. And then we get bigger, and we're like, oh, you guys are too big for me. Yeah. And when it just keep it keeps happening and happening and happening and happening. Yeah. And it's you know, again I was just talking to this label and it was like, ah, your numbers are too good for us, basically. Yeah. Right? Because we were thinking we were releasing something with a label and because no, I won't get I don't want to announce it yet. But okay. but we were talking to this label and we were basically saying that our numbers are too big for them. Yeah. And and it makes no sense for us to do it with them. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, before they wouldn't answer us and now and now we're like yeah, it makes no sense. So, yeah. I don't know. And also, the, I mean, right now it's a good time to talk because the stakes are low. There's not a lot of money in music as it is. And I, I don't know. It's not, like, it's not like being a politician when they ask you a question and you just need to push an agenda. It's like, dude, you can just, you can say what's on your mind. But I, and also, who is the, the, who is the asshole that, you know, that, uh, oh, Kenny Garrett listens to me now. And when he's like, oh my God, this guy is so good. We should do an album together like Coltrane. Like Coltrane and Sonny Rollins will do Kenny Garrett, Danny Markovich record. And then somebody were like, hey, he said he used to like you, but he doesn't like you. But he likes you more than other people, but he doesn't really like you. So you shouldn't work with him. It's like, this is not going to happen. Listen, I mean, I don't know if Kenny G listens to this and is offended by something we said. Um, I, you know, and, we, and somehow me and old Kenny meet and uh, we talk. I'm probably going to apologize. I'll be like, what, what did I say that hurt your feelings? Yeah. That you're a vegan? I'm sorry that I, offend, I offended Oatflake, your son, or <laughs> Moondance, your fiance. Yeah. Like, Kenny. You know, I'll take it back, Kenny. Kenny, if you want, yeah. if you want to uh, you know, do a saxophone solo album, you, me. Fine. No, let's do or you, Pat. me, and Chris Porter, and Pat Metheny. Yeah, Metheny. Listen, 
I said I said gay lion in a sailor shirt. I didn't mean that. And I said Greg no, Obama said it. said it. Yeah. yeah. So I don't. I never thought you we, looked like we, that. I thought you looked. And hot he as quit. Yeah. <laughs> I won't say we fired him, but he quit. He quit. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, I take that back. Uh, well, no. I, no. I, I, keep, I keep it on the table, but I will take that back if you want to work together. Yeah. It's like <laughs> we're open. I don't we're care. Open. Yeah. I'll apologize for anything I say. Yeah, I don't care. Yeah, not everything, but a lot of things. Um, I, I do, like, a part of me, every time I, I talk shit about Rick Beato, it's like, ooh. Maybe. You really bought it from nowhere, because we, we never said a word about him. <laughs> and just... Oh, no, not, not in this format, but I'm going to now. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, but, but uh, yeah, I've, I've talked shit about him a few times. Not about him. I mean, he looks like, he's probably a very nice guy. I'm assuming they're all nice people, right? Or, or decent. Or not. Maybe Listen, there was thing, there is something that we didn't uh, mention, but there was thing when sucking at music. And there's definitely a thing when sucking at music, but being better than most people, but still not uh, playing something that we like. Right. So, yeah. yeah we're pretty it's, it's not that much a big insult. You know, the, the thing with Kurt Ottenwickel that taught me, Kurt listened to our music and he hated it the most. Kurt, so, okay. he, he loathed it. Kurt loathed our music, like... Loads. Like he, he thought we were the worst thing ever. He he saw us open for Alan Holdsworth, and he came up to Alan's manager mid tour when we were touring together and driving him and and asked him to fire us because Alan shouldn't be uh, associated with us. Associated associated with even us, though Alan yeah. loved our music and didn't like cult music, so I personally saw Alan like it was. I will share it with you guys because I don't like Kurt. Um, what happened was... Do you really want to share it? Because people are going to... No, I don't know. No, let's keep it. I know it's great podcasting. Let's keep it for later. I'm sorry. It's too much. Mm-hmm. It's too much, Danny. Mm-hmm. It's it too, too much? Mu- it's too much for now, yeah. We're coming for you, Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but uh, I'll, I'll just go to the point, okay? okay. That I always hated Kurt's music, right? And Kurt, <laughs> if you... If you <laughs> That's not too much? No. But if you will... Um, let's do an album together. Why not? Maybe maybe we can together make something we both like. But he hated our music too. And that made me understand, you know, he hated the music, he hated my playing, like everything about my playing. He hated... And I was like, he does his music because he likes it and I do my music because I like it and I don't know anything like his music because I can't stand it and he doesn't do anything like my music because he can't stand that. So it's like those people that I don't like they already don't like me, even if they, even if they know yeah. me. And if they don't know me, they're not going to like me. Just they don't like you and they don't like anything you represent. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Kurt, Kurt he, did, he did do one amazing thing with his career. He's the only musician I know that got less famous from playing Crossroads. <laughs> I don't know how you do that. It's, so, it's on PBS. <laughs> it's like everywhere. Well, probably people watch it less, no? Maybe in airports. <laughs> what do we watch PBS? Who puts PBS on? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe that's why. Maybe because nobody watches it anymore. No, but it's like you can network with like literally all the money in guitar. Can we do some... crossroads? Eric Clapton. Can you I, please let me on Whatever I said about you, please let me on crossroads. <laughs> what do they call him? Slow finger? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Anyways. Anyway, Cole, let's do an album together. Yeah, you, Kurt. me, Kurt, Kenny I'll, Garrett. I'll come. I'll come and play rhythm guitar. <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it, Kurt. Between us, we can make something we both hate. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, yeah. But he did hate everything about the music, like everything. the melodies, well, the okay, arrangement. We, we the sent solos. him. So what we were in? We were in Starbucks in Buffalo on tour. Never, Buffalo, New York. I'll never forget it. And uh, it was like nighttime in Germany where he lived at the time. Um, and I remember I caught him on a Facebook Messenger thing, like we were friends on Facebook. And he just, uh, I was just opening up a conversation. We, ju- we were he, just about to release this album. Last chapter of Dreaming, our third album. And I was with him for hours on the computer making him listen to every song. And the whole correspondence, if you just look for Marvin Kurt Rosenwinkel on, on hated Google. It. Uh, I, I posted it because I'm a dick uh, but he just hated every song and I kept yeah, Danny egging should, him on Danny shouldn't have posted it but I, I shouldn't have posted it and then it I got was back against to him. it yeah. it got back to him it was you know I was young then 
I made and mistakes. nobody knew us. I, so would, it's like I made didn't... mistakes that I would probably make in an instant. <laughs> no, again. no, you wouldn't make it and again. I, I wouldn't do it again. But I did it, and it's a, it's immortalized on the web, so you can read it. Um, and he he was upset that I did that, and it was a dick move on my part. I I, I admit now, but now it's too late. Now all I can do yeah, is let it hates us. get buried in the obscurity of the internet and never tell anybody. Uh, about this correspondence but yeah he just went song by song and just talked shit How much mad shit it. about it but at the end of a conversation he kind of warmed up to me as a person yeah I, I talked to him you you took that off but I talked to him also afterwards yeah and it, it was kind of nice and yeah. then he posted it and then I posted it because we were kind of like friendly afterwards and then you posted it and he hates us now <laughs> he hates us forever <laughs> but um, yeah well you can be you can be friends if you disagree on music Right, you know, and it's it's fine. Yeah, but you can't be friends if you post a yeah, conversation. Yeah, yeah, but like that. but my larger point was that those people that we again talk shit, say that we don't like a part of our music or an aspect of our music. Mm-hmm. It's like they don't like our music either. No, that, or, or maybe they point. do. And if Kurt if Kurt like loves strong thing, I'll accept it. You yeah. know, it's like it's a totally okay that like his last album was like terrible and ours was great. And if we both can agree on that, then that's what it is. Yeah, and again, if you want to do something that we both, we both gonna love, <laughs> I'll write a note. You write a note, and let's do it. Yeah, throw notes on each other. Yeah, I don't, I don't kill. Great. All right. Well, this <laughs> on this optimistic, on this optimistic note, note yeah, <laughs> we're gonna name this episode "Love Kurt." No. No. Okay. Bye, everybody. No, no, we talk about... Oh, what? let's talk about st- places to listen to our music. Uh, best place is Bandcamp. Go to marvinmusic.bandcamp.com and we have a free sampler, one song from each album, and we all have all of our merch, album shirts, all that stuff. Subscribe to this podcast and you can always follow us at facebook.com slash marvinmusic. Uh, yeah, I think it's... Yeah. All right.